<laughs> Welcome to the Planet 5D live broadcast, and today we're going to have a, a new friend of ours, a young man by the name of Jonathan Yee, who is a director and cinematographer and an all-around do-around good guy, um, who has recently gotten his hands on a prototype of the Canon C300 new EOS cinema lens. Cinema lens. It's not a lens, it's a camera image. And we're going to have a conversation with him today about that, and we're going to talk to all of the people in the chat room who are furiously typing in questions I see already, which we will get to in just a few minutes. But first, I want to introduce you to Jonathan Yee. Say hi. Hello. Of course, the first thing is that people want to know a little bit about you because you've kind of just burst onto the scene with this fantastic uh, C300 thing, but I have to admit that I didn't know who you were, so let's make sure that they know who you are as we get started. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm just a freelance director, cinematographer. Uh, I'm also a teacher at uh, NYU's uh, to School of the Arts Film School. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> well, how long have you been directing? Um, if you ask my accountant, it would probably be two and a half years. Uh, <laughs> it's just depending upon what you write on your tax returns, what's <laughs> what you do most, I say. Yeah, so that, yeah. I think the IRS should just dictate what your job title is, ultimately. Uh, I see, so. Well, that's that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I I don't even know what the heck I put on my uh, tax forms these days. I I asked especially about your age, be or or the age of how long you've been directing, because you look like you're just like right out of high school to me. You look very yeah, I'm, young. I'm 16 years old. Are you no. really? No. <laughs> no. See, you got me. <laughs> All right, that was Jonathan Yee. We're done with him now. <laughs> now, uh, why are you asking my name? No, I'm asking you. I mean, how old my, you my, are. my age. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to search my age, like you could do it online. It's there. But, okay. uh, but I usually tell people a range. Uh, it's the most common question I get, actually. Um, but I'm 29. Awesome. You're you're doing some amazing stuff for 29. Um, and we're, we're I'm going to show some of the things that you've done as we go through this. So don't be surprised, people out there in TV land, if you see a, a video pop up, and we may or may not talk about it at the time. Um, somebody in the chat room says you look like you're 13. Oh man, I wish That's I could good. say that. <laughs> Actually, I could probably show you a photo of when I was 13. I looked exactly the same. So. Wow. <laughs> That's terrific. I'm jealous. Although I did have somebody tell me not too long ago I looked like I was about 38, even though I'm 53. So, uh, Well, I'm going to be 29 uh, for from now on. I oh, think. you're going to be one of those guys. All right. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that, and, I, and I'm going to switch over this so that it, it goes ahead and starts playing and I'm assuming it's going to play. This was, there it goes. So this is the C300 video that you got. So the first question out of my, my hands is how in the heck did you get a hand, your hands on one of the prototypes? Um, well, I was working as a contractor for Canon USA in Lake Success, New York, and, um, Basically, I, the education department wanted me to get familiar with the camera so I could um, create uh, test images and possibly a video for the launch and doing um, general you know, evaluation of the camera so I could write an article, which I actually did write an article, and that is available online. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But I did use these images to come back with uh, what I thought was a funny test video. So, um, you know... The, I was just a contractor. I was just there for a very brief moment of time, and um, you know this this project just kind of didn't live on. Besides the article, you know. So you had your hands on the camera for a week. Is that right? Well, I was shooting with it for a week, but I had the uh, my hands on the camera and earlier iterations of it before then, um, just advising for the C three hundred. That's why I, w I was hired to advise for that in the education department. So awesome. So a couple of people have asked about that uh, ice cream uh, short. That was just a joke, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we played around with a lot of different, more offensive movies. That <laughs> movie, but. Um, 
I wonder. I, I'm going to try this. I haven't tried ever tried this before. There's, um, I've always just let. Oops, Mitch made a boo boo in the recording of the show, and we lost about thirty seconds of audio. It wasn't too bad, but we thought we'd remove it from this recording so you wouldn't have to suffer. What did I do wrong? Okay, um, so while you were gone, <laughs> we were talking, uh, starting to talk about the um, uh, the rolling shutter issues and, and how, if you wouldn't mind, um, Jonathan, just briefly talk about the experience you had with the rolling shutter and how vastly different it is. Yeah, I mean, um, basically when we started having to use DSLRs for things, really, I, I noticed it changed a lot of the ways that people shot movies, you know. I used to be a big 16 meter guy. I still love the film and I, I love aggressive camera movement. Um, so when DSLRs came onto the scene, I wasn't allowed to shoot like that anymore, you know, because it was just so wobbly. So, you know, now with this camera, the, the double speed readout allows you to shoot the way that you used to. Tongue's not working. You said double speed readout. That phrase is not familiar to all of us. Would you explain what that means? Well, meaning the sensor readout. It's it's not a global shutter. Right. The shutters. Uh, I mean, the the sensor is still reading from the top of the sensor down to the bottom of the sensor, but it's double the speed. So it's it's you know it's going to be it, it's much more reduced. The rolling shutter and all those issues with motion. So you have some understanding that I don't have. Um, because they didn't give me a whole lot of details on how all of that technical stuff works, so I'm very impressed. So you you were, I, I guess, how how do you know some of those things about the technical issues, the way the the shutter, the rolling shutter was reduced and set? It's <laughs> come on. Well, I don't know. I don't know exactly how they did it because I'm not. It's all proprietary information. I'm not even supposed to say if I did know how they did it. I can't explain why or how they did it. Okay. But um, but all I can say is for a user of the camera, it just means that if you move the camera around like crazy, you know, you can actually do it. You can move it like you know, fr the French Connection or something. You could shoot in the in the way that you could with film. You right. know, you could move aggressively with film in a way that you cannot with a DSLR because of the skew. Right. Um, so. It allows you to, like, for example, that cobblestone road shot. The shot is just a bad shot, but it's bad in a different way. You know, it's a shaky shot. It's not a wobbly shot. It's not a jello -y shot. It's a very different look. Right. right. One of the things that when I was at the uh, Canon presentation uh, on November 3rd was that I was, I was sort of disappointed at how how little technical information they actually gave out. And yeah, so, I was there. Were you, did you see me there? I was in the Cine Gallery. If I had known who you were, <laughs> I, I might have stopped and said, hey. I was the one Asian guy in the, the scene, sea of Asian people. Um, actually, uh, I probably did see you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I right, no. Um, I... I I came very late to you're talking about the the room where they had all of the presentation material after the big auditorium we moved to a separate Yeah, room. yeah, it's where that you could do a hands-on with the camera in the back with right. those those actors who are just shuttling through. Um I missed 90% of that because what happened was after the auditorium thing I had an interview back in the interview room and I was really don't canon don't tell Canon I said this, right? Um, it was at the very back of Paramount. So I had to walk like a mile, it seemed a mile, to get back to where the interviews were being done. Mm -hmm. And then I had to do the interview. And then I had to walk back. And by the time I walked back, they said, you got 15 minutes left for this portion, and then you got to move on. And so I, I missed all of that stuff where you were, virtually, which kind of irritated me. But um, so let's let's dive in and ask some of the questions because they're starting to pile up from the chat room. By the way, um, 
Guests with an unknown name asks, what is Jonathan's take on the 8 versus 10-bit argument? Is 8-bit a non-starter for serious film work? This is the most common question about the camera, and I would say that this really is a non-issue to me. Um, there used to be a technical explanation up as to why, you know, it is an 8-bit processing, uh, but that is no longer available because that information we're not allowed to actually discuss. I think that people shouldn't be really focused on, um, and I, you know, I don't work for Canon anymore, but I still can't talk about the things that I learned while I was there. Right. But all I would say is that if people are upset with this technical thing of 8 or 10 bit, which a lot of people are, I think that you should just actually try the camera. Um, there was an entire movie shot um, green screen called Exit, which they showed at the, at the screening room, if you saw that. Right. Um, and, and, you know, on paper, this camera is not that impressive. Uh, I, I admit that. You know, you look at it and you're like, okay, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, so why this codec? Why, why is it processed this way? Why, you know, why are things the way that they are specifically? But when you actually use the camera and take the time to use it, I think that's when you really see that it's a lot stronger than the specs indicate. Um, and this is the only camera, I think, that is a purchasable camera that's, you know, I'm not talking about Alexa here. I'm talking about cameras that normal people can buy. Uh, the only camera that really... You can use the onboard codec, you know, in a way that that is really great for like green screen and things like that. I mean, you could use. I mean, I do a lot of work with Red products as well, um, but I because I work with Red products a lot, I, I do have a lot of frustrations with it, and I do have clients that refuse to allow me to use it. So, um, for the most part, I I use Alexa, uh, but. I'm not looking at specs on any of these things because Alexa, the way I use Alexa, you know, it's a 1080p output. And people have also asked about, is 1080 enough? And I would say, yes, it is. I mean, you've seen Drive, and if you've seen uh, any Alexa-captured movie, uh, like Hugo, for example, um, you know, certain things are more important than you know, that 4K output. And I think the thing is, when you start using the C300, it's just a really amazing looking camera. Well, that obviously is one of the the questions that has really been bantered around. And I, I got to spend some time uh, at dinner with the Canon guys. And, you know, they, they really went on and on and on about the fact that there aren't a whole lot of real uses right now for 4K. It's great to shoot in and be able to down res, you know, and, and maybe pick out certain segments of, you know, a video if you want to do some cropping or whatever. Um, but their take on, on the current market was that 1080 is the place to be right now. And when 4K comes more serious into the market, they'll be ready for it. Well, look at Alexa, right? Alexa right. really decimated a lot of things out there for prioritizing the correct things, I think. And, um, they took their time. They talked to the right people. Uh, people look good shot with the Alexa. Skin tones look great. Um, and the workflow is amazing. I think the workflow is better than C300 for sure. But, um, but you know, it, in most of my commercials and things, I, I, I shoot on Alexa and I, I have B-roll shot on 5Ds and 7Ds, you know, and um, just for small specialty shots, right? For being small, and also for times when I can't afford a guy to just carry around the batteries. So you know, I think that this camera really will be popular, especially as a B camera for those things. But we're talking about different markets here. I think I think that um, some people say that I'm wrong about this, but I think that this is going to be very strong in television and documentary uh, and broadcast, where you need something that just straight up looks great. And is easy to work with, right? Um, in a way that, like, you know, shooting something with red might eventually look really good. And I've done a lot of projects that I'm happy with that I shot with red stuff. But for a lot of the stuff I do, honestly, like, it has to just be able to work with the post people. I, mean, I don't shoot independent films just for myself. You know, it's a different story when you're doing only your own stuff, and when your camera goes down, that's okay because you get it. But right. if if your camera goes down while they're paying you a lot that day, you just seem like a jerk, you know, right. and explain it to them. 
of cameras that you've used speaking of that particular issue how many cameras go down Does the alexa does the alexa ever crash no alexa has never gone down for me i've actually we used one of the first alexas in new york when we still had to do the dual link output um, our Steadicam operator dropped it with an Optimo, on it. <laughs> but it was still totally fine because right. it's an airy built product. It's right. a German product. It's it was amazing. Right, and it's uh, virtually an eighty thousand dollar camera, right? Somewhere in that range. I, I think it's in that ballpark. Yeah. Right. I'm not thinking about buying it, so I don't really know. But. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to buy the batteries, honestly, to to power that thing. For the Alexa. So. Yeah, or for any of those serious cameras. Right. They just need batteries a lot, you know, and those batteries are heavy. Right. And um, that's why it's not an owner-operator camera. Right. Do you think that the C300 is going to be sort of in that realm, that people are going to rent it more than buy it? No way. I think everyone's going to buy it. Okay. I'm not I think you'll buy want it. To, <laughs> once you use it, I think you'll want to buy it. You'll, you'll figure out a way. Do you think the price is coming down? Yeah. Do you know any kind of price range that it's going to come down to? I just think it has to, just because um, it just because it, it just has to. I think they're just being conservative with when they're saying that it'll list at a certain price. They think that the general public understands what that means because you're saying when you say list, it's a pretty vague thing to say, right? So, well, that's that's true for most products, but if you look at the 5D Mark III or 5D Mark II, sorry slip um you know canon hell has has held most vendors to the price range and only recently has the price started really kind of coming down but it doesn't come down 500 or thousand dollars it comes down one or 200 so canon's at least in the dslr market has held the prices really tight so well, I think that this camera isn't necessarily – this particular camera is a first step in, in Canon's commitment to um, this cinema market, right? right? It's their first camera. It doesn't mean that it's their last camera. Right. I don't think that this camera is specifically geared towards the DSLR community. I think a lot of people felt that they had abandoned that DSLR community, but I don't think that they have. I can't talk about anything other than the fact that this is just their first camera. Right. But I just think that this is – for somebody like me, I mean, this is what I want because it's something that I would use. And especially if I'm doing night exteriors, something like that, I would choose this over the Alexa on a big job. Would you? you know, I, yeah, I absolutely would because I can't get that. I can't get 20,000 ISO right. you know, like on anything else. And to, to get that amount of sensitivity, I think, justifies the cost anyway. It just, you know, if you're working it enough, it just, you have to be working enough. Right, right. Um, the Alexa is about almost two years old now, isn't it? Year and a half, I guess. So we uh, might we might it, see a little leapfrogging going on here. I mean, the Alexa is a beautiful camera for other reasons, too. I mean, operationally, it's exactly what a film person wants. You know, everything is in the right place. Controls make sense. Right. Yeah. That means a lot, too. Um, you mentioned that the uh, Alexa actually has better controls, you think, than the, the C300. Yeah. Um, I noticed that, I'm going to switch back over to the photos that you had posted. I noticed that um, the one that you were using has has all the labels on it. So you actually, I mean, that was an early prototype. Yeah. Oh, and I, and I wanted to go back before I forget. Um, by the way, we were talking about the price. Uh, were you in the auditorium during the announcement? Or were you I back was, in the other I was doing other. I was doing other stuff during the announcement. Um, it, a, a couple of people have asked me about this, so I wanted to uh, p just particularly highlight it. If you've been to uh, or watched the uh, Apple announcements when they like announce the prices of things, and most of the time people go, yay! Um, when Canon was asked during the announcement on November 3rd about what the price was, there were crickets. I mean, <laughs> it was dead silence. Because everybody had sort of talked about the price range of the camera being 15000 ish And when, it was, when the, the 20 number was announced, 
they they might have gotten a little bit better of a, a feeling from people if they'd even just said nineteen as opposed to twenty. But that's what I was saying. It's a one. It's like saying one dollar ninety nine or two dollars. I right. mean, people just focus on the first digit. So. Right. Um, but it was it was just dead quiet in that room when they said twenty thousand. I just. I, I, think that was I think they must have heard that loud and clear that people are <laughs> unhappy about the price and uh-huh, especially uh-huh. the presentation of that price. And I think that they they know how people feel about it. I mean, all I can say is that the camera is a great camera and it's a very sensible camera and it's a camera that I think I'll use a lot. Right. I think I'll get a lot of use out of it. And And a lot of people on Twitter, by the way, have certainly been echoing that, especially... Um, it, they're so thrilled with the video that you put out. I mean, I know you've gotten two hundred fifty thousand views and or more at this point, point. Um, and it's only been out a week today, I think, right? Well, tomorrow, tomorrow night will be a week. Okay. Um, the the it's it's been amazing to me, and I I started to go through those photos, and now I'm going to come back and and talk to talk to myself. I guess it's been amazing to me that the the flow of conversation that i keep track of on twitter especially has gone i mean it was like everybody was red 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 scarlet wins scarlet wins and then your video came out and now it's like cannons going <laughs> i mean everybody said well after i've seen jonathan's video i i'm really seriously considering the c300 so you've you've had quite an impact even though it wasn't an official canon video well, I'm happy to hear that. I mean, um, I was pretty discouraged when uh, the video was kind of uh, killed because, you know, a lot of my friends helped me with it. Uh, right. We took very reduced rates to produce the video just because my friends who work with me on commercials and docs, like, they were like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll help you out. And, the, you know, they were very excited to see it because we all thought it was funny. Um, so for it to die uh, was, was kind of <laughs> sad. And also to be at the event and and, you know, you know, just not not being able to explain to people these these hard and f- like these hard facts about the camera, like you know you can, that all these detailed things. When they say that Scarlet wins, and we're like, well, they have different strengths. You know, they have different right. reasons why they exist, and and you really can't compare the two. Like they're very very different. Like there's certain jobs that I can't use red products because they're not it's just different reasons you know if it's just talking heads for example i i used to do talking heads with two red ones and sometimes one would overheat and then you know like things would happen um for example there was one time we did a td ameritrade job we all flew to toronto we were there for five days to interview a big boss for 30 minutes you know and the most important thing was that the camera was stable you know, and that we would record it and it'd be fine. And the guy, you know, could leave because he was so important, you know. And this camera would be perfect for that because it, it's really reliable. It can record onto two compact flash cards at the same time for right. instant backup. And these are compact flash cards, you know. So you can back them up like crazy. And um, I, I don't know. I think this really fits what I do really well. It might not fit what... A lot of other people are looking for, but I think that, you know, I love when skin tones, like when people look good, that's the most important thing for me. Right. Uh, low light sensitivity is and mobility is really important to me. And I always complain about batteries, but this is a big deal. I mean, if you're going to own something, it really is awful to own a lot of batteries that are very expensive, have to get reselled all the time. Some of them that are too big, that they can't fly. Um you know, you can't get on a plane with them. You know, that's that's annoying too. I mean, this is a camera that you could see people going because it's weatherproof as well. You know, somebody could go on the top of Mount Everest with this camera. You know, in a way that I used to always think it was just like film cameras could only handle that kind of stuff. I laugh every time I see this section. <laughs> uh, there's so much of this that you did so well that it just cracks me up. Um and so they are actually hearing the audio of us this time. So I, I checked in the chat room, by the way. So I'm sorry I screwed that up before. Um, one of the questions uh, is about the EVF from somebody in the chat room. How good is the EVF? Do you need to use a different one? No, you don't need to use any ex- external anything. I mean, that's the best. The thing I love about this camera is that 
you know, if you compare it to a DSLR, it's slightly bigger. Right. Um, but the thing is, in order to use a DSLR properly, you need a Zacuto finder. You right. need um, you need all kinds of stuff to make it stable. You know, you just need to have something. With this camera, you don't need anything. And, uh, and people think it's weird because you look at it and it doesn't make any sense, but you really don't. I mean, you don't need anything. And uh, both viewfinders are very helpful. Like, um, I used an F3 once on a DuPont commercial and uh, really didn't enjoy my experience with it because everything about it, I was a former EX3 owner, everything about it just didn't make sense to me. Like, both viewfinders weren't helpful. Um, they were in weird places. In order to balance the camera on your shoulder, then both the LCD and the the back viewfinder were way behind you, right. and you needed to invest in an external monitor with its own battery set and everything. Um, I think this is a complete package out of the box. This is another thing that when I was working at at the Hollywood event, I had felt was I wish it was a little bit different. Uh, I was in a section where we showed a lot of third party accessories, like uh, things built out from right. Airy, Red Rock different companies and so people see that the camera all built out and they assume oh i had to pay twenty thousand dollars and a half to buy all this stuff too right you know like right. that's not the case if you know if you can show just what comes in the box it it is awesome like that it works and in the end it's actually much smaller than a built-out dslr because you don't need to add anything to it right uh, i was kind of impressed by the way I'm sorry, I was just watching the audio meters, <laughs> making sure my body, audio was going out. Uh, I was impressed with the fact that they had several rig vendors with stuff available. I know they, the Red Rock was the one that was shown uh, in all the behind the scenes, so they, Red Rock was out there early with their stuff. Uh, and Canon, Canon, of course, you know, asked them to have the stuff ready in order to be able to do it for all of the, the movies that were shot. So... I, I really applauded Canon for for making that move early, as opposed to waiting until after the release and everybody's scrambling to try to get that stuff ready. Although I know I I did hear what you say, and we don't necessarily have to buy a rig or all the other accessories. Um, well, it depends on what you do. You right. know, it depends on what what you're up to. Uh, the, the problem is that with the DSLR, it doesn't matter what you do. You kind of need something. Right. You know. Right. Um, question from the chat room. Am I, am, blah, blah, blah. Come on, tongue. Am I right with this? Hert would like to know. The LCD screen and XLR plugs are one unit, and that is fixed on the flash shoe of the camera. The XLR inputs are part of the LCD unit. It, I don't know what you mean by fixed on the thing. It, it is attached through um, a hot or cold shoe, but... Right. Uh, but it's not, it's, you know, you can actually mount it in a lot of different ways. Is There's also a mini jack on the body itself. Um, if you wanted to use one of those tiny little road mics or something right, uh, for scratch audio, you could right. use that and just plug it in. Um, or use it as your real audio if you want. I've just never used those things before. So I generally don't run audio to the camera, so I don't really um, know much about that. So Okay. Uh, is is the I'm suddenly getting some feedback from somewhere. Um is the monitor it's I mean it, it looks kind of gangly up there on the top of the camera. Is it sturdy? Is it I mean I touched and felt it, but it I haven't actually sat and used it like you did. You, what do you mean? Is it just are you saying it looks like a mess or something? Yeah, or? I mean it, it's got that arm and it's you know Yeah, it's, it's awesome. I love it. I mean, Is yeah, it? I think that it's great, actually. It just looks it just looks kind of like it's stuck out there. I don't there. understand. Like, there's been so many comments about it. They're like, this is an ugly camera. And I look at it, and I'm like, this looks great. I, oh, I don't know. I guess I just have different tastes or something. I don't know. It, I, it's very functional. I think it's, I think it's an, a, a very attractive camera it's, itself. When I first saw the, the photos before, um, I, I was very impressed with the look of it. Um, I thought I was getting an alert that the audio wasn't going out. Sorry. So here's some some of your shots, by the way. But you know, if you look at, you can see that. I mean, it, it just that monitor sticks so far out there compared to where the body is. 
Yeah, because when you hold the body, that's where the LCD should be. The problem with cameras that you've had it on the side is just like by the time you bounce the camera, the LCD was behind you. I right. think the LCD exactly is exactly in the position that you want it to be. Okay, good. I love this shot. You're obviously showing the actors what they were seeing. I was what, just showing what? my friends. They were just in the back <laughs> of the truck. Okay. Uh, let's see. Jumping into some of the other questions. And, and this probably was earlier, but um, are you planning on buying one of these? Yeah, I will definitely buy one of these, which would be my first real digital video camera because I've hated them for so long. Um, um, Herod says the connection on the top looks a bit weak for the LCD screen and the and audio, which is what I just said. I would say that my prototype was way worse also than how it ended up becoming. So based on the photos in my stuff, I would say that it, it was still fine, but I think that it's it, the, the stuff I've touched for the, the newer models is much sturdier. Cool. The chat room wants to know, how's the menu system of the C300? Is it DSLR-like or different? It is different. It is, the menu system is very similar to Canon's video products, um, which is just their video line, their XF cameras, um, which I actually didn't know about until I, I, I started consulting with Canon. Um, but the menu systems do take some time to get used to. If, if you're used to an, uh, the Sony products, like the F3, um, it's, it's kind of like that, unfortunately. Um, it's very confusing if you don't know certain things about it. They did say that this the, they would change certain things about it, but um, the menu is the thing that really uh, it takes a little bit of time to get used to if you're coming from film. Do you know, by the way, whether or not this was sort of a combination? <laughs> Canon has two distinct lines of business. One is the DSLR line, um, and one is the video line. And I've always been told that the video guys and the DSLR guys never speak to each other. Do you know whether or not there was some cohabitation on this project? Um, I don't know who was from which department, so I, I don't know. I mean, they had the best people, I think, working on this camera. Um, the main thing is, what's really funny is that I think that we've been so heavy on the specs. Everyone's always talking about right. specs, specs, specs all the time. But when it comes down to it, it's just like, what looks the best? You know, like, I gave, for example, this 8-bit, 10-bit thing that always comes up. Right. When my colorist was working with this footage, you know, and this Canon Log Gamma footage, I mean, he was like, this is great, you know. He got a lot of information out of it, and, you know, that's coming from an 8-bit codec, you know. Um, so there was no complaints there. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm impressed to hear you say that, you know, the, the specs are important, but the actual output of the camera is what's, what's really most important. And I'm, I'm hoping the rest of the world sees that as well. Well, considering that people have started to shoot with DSLRs because of how it looked versus a right. better spec video camera, Right, because uh, um, they could have always gone like you know when you shoot things like there is an HBO show Ring Life and shot on DSLRs for that look rather than shooting on say a more stable video camera system because it's just about how it looks. Right, and in, if you talk about ingenue lenses, some of those lenses actually would probably have very poor test results in terms of sharpness. Um, but people look great with those lenses. So it really is about, I think, for me, what's important is that people look really good. And um, sometimes you have cameras that, um, you know, I mean, when I shoot with red, it, it, it's, it's really hard for me to massage the skin tones to make it look not so red-ish. Like, it has a very distinct look to it, you know. Same thing with DSLRs has a distinctive look to it, too. Um, but I think that, you know, I think this new camera strikes a good balance. Um, showing one of your red clips, by the way, that you sent me, although it looks yeah. a little jerky. Yeah, that was uh, also with the same colorist, and we went back with that a few times. Um, but that was uh, the first 
one of the first New York shoots with a uh, red one, non-MX. Uh, we had a lot of technical problems on this one. Um, but, um, but yeah, this was a very early thing. I was an early adopter for this camera. so. And that's the red. Yep, that's the red one. That was the non-MX red one. Um, I am reading the chat, another chat room, the one the in Ustream that um, Diana, we're all in a different chat room, by the way. Diana says, I'm one of the Canon tech in New York, and we have merged with photo, video, and printer reps all in one group. So that's interesting. Um, nice to have you, by the way, Diana. Please bring mon more of your Canon people with you next time. I'm And I've got her on a monitor over here, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I keep turning to all these different monitors. So, uh, Isn't RAW... Guest asks, isn't raw red raw a major plus point for red? I think raw is incredible. I think that it is a huge plus point. However, sometimes um, you need another option too. The thing is, uh, the great thing about Canon Log is that it it gives you it splits the difference. Like um, anybody can work with it, and anybody can get great color correction out of it. Um, raw might give you a little bit more uh, control, but it's not going to, you know, it's it's going to cause some problems for people even now, which is really weird that it's still causing problems for people now. And at the end of the day, even though I used to always fight everybody to allow me to shoot with red, at the end of the day, like, I had to end a job. You know, I had to get out the door. I needed um, things to work, you know. Right. right. And I needed control too. I didn't want I didn't want to walk out the door and for them not to know how to deal with our three Ds and it coming out looking awful. You know that that happens a lot. You know, and um, I'm very particular about how I grade my red footage. Um, There's certain ways I don't want that red footage to turn out. So um, you know, it requires a lot more from me, and and it, sometimes it's just really not an option for certain jobs. And the main thing is main thing is. Uh, reliability on set it's 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 that's the key point of is reliability on set that um i have to trust that the camera's going to work i have enough stuff on my mind because a lot of times i'm the director and the dp uh i have a lot of stuff to deal with you know and i just need the camera to just work first of all so that's why i primarily always shoot with alexa um so i think that i'm happy that this camera looks good and is reliable the same guest asks, after hearing that, sounds like you were saying red would be the better of the two if it were consistent. Depends on what you're shooting, because I would rather shoot human beings with uh, the C300. If I was shooting, um, I don't know, other stuff, like <laughs> if I was doing HDR stuff, I don't know, like skies and scenics and whatever it may be. Right. You know, but, um, and also I just really like about the C300 is the way that it goes into highlights. Um, the thing about that film always defeated video is that the way that it rolled off into highlights. It didn't clip. If, you, if you're familiar with the F3 and the uh, XD cam stuff, like the, uh, what was it, the EX3, which I used to own, right. uh, it, it goes into highlights in a very video Sony specific highlight clip. And I think that the C300 really rolls it off really nice in a very filmic way. And besides that, I forgot to mention that what I like about the C300 is the noise on the C300 looks like nothing else. It looks like filmic. It doesn't look um, like video noise. I mean, right. it, it just looks very, very different. It has a sandy texture to it, and it doesn't have, like, that color skew, that, like, bluish, horrible hue that we're used to seeing a lot. It was very astounding to sit in that auditorium in uh, in the Paramount Theater, and I and I asked about what the projector was, and nobody could give me any details. But it's obviously an astounding projector. But really, heard complaints about that projector. I heard the films didn't look so good in that theater. Well, no. maybe it was because I was in the second row or something. But I I was amazed at the. I mean, I was looking for things like you were just talking about the film grain, or, or you know the the noise issues and the darks and and it, the dynamic range of the camera, but the the noise itself, like you said, is very, very different than we've ever seen out of any DSLR. Um, and so that's one of the things that blew me away right off the bat. 
Yeah, I think, but you know, what's really funny is also a problem that you start coming with these high ISOs is like, well, first of all, it's really hard to explain to somebody how dark something is when you show them that it's a normally exposed image. Right. You know, like, um, it's really hard to sell high ISOs to people. I'm surprised that people were taken with the video with that because it's really hard to explain unless you were there, right. you know, to see actually how dark right. it really was, you know, because it just looks normally exp- It's like taking a photo at long exposure and being like, well, trust me, it was really dark. Yeah. You know, you can't tell, you know. Right. So I think that's why people are blown away when they use it in person. You know, the stuff we shot on the gondola thing, like that was 10,000 ISO. That's ridiculous. And the, the sun was pretty much gone. Um, it looks like daytime. Right. You, you can see like uh, everyone's headlights are on. You know, it was pretty dark, you know, and I was shooting at a 5.6, you know. Um, so that was that was pretty incredible. That was one of the same things that Vincent LaFore told me a couple of weeks ago when I was talking to him was that, you know, that it's just so amazing that, when you take it into a dark environment, how much it actually sees. Yeah, one thing that you would also notice is that, you know, sometimes people would look at 20,000 ISO images and be like, well, that just, that still looks noisy to me. It's like, well, you know, what I realized when I was shooting some stuff is it wasn't actually a noise problem. It was that the light sources themselves were just really bad. Right. Because if you can't actually see what's hitting someone's skin and it's just spill from a million different awful sources, right. like in an alleyway right. or whatever, then it's going to just be a bad source. So that's a new problem. Um, guests, a five oh what a number or some number. Can you clear up this quote from your review? Quote: Furthermore, there is no built-in exposure meeting or metering or automatic exposure. Are yep. you are you saying this has no built-in exposure meter at all? It has no exposure meter in the traditional sense that it tells your lens what it should be exposing for. But it does have a histogram and it has zebras and those traditional tools, which I think you should be using anyway. Right. Um, but it doesn't work that way with those lenses where if you put on a video lens on a video camera, it could control your iris. It could do all these things for you. It doesn't do that. I noticed from your pictures that you were shooting on the – your. I, I'm assuming they're your own – uh, let me switch back over there. Um, your own Canon L lenses or whatever. You weren't using the new Cinema EOS lenses that they announced. Is that correct? No, I mean, the, we didn't have any of those available. And also, those are so huge. I mean, I mean the zooms, at least. Right. The primes, I mean, are, are were not, and I think still not, uh, ready to be sh- shipped or used by anybody. Um, so it was all still glass. Why? And actually, that was really cool to finally use um, the seventy to two hundred on a real camera. That was that was fun because because uh, I love that lens. And we actually pulled focus on it remotely, crazily enough, from the bike shots. Oh yeah, so, yeah. But because uh, people always say that that's impossible to focus, but you just need a good focus puller. So I've heard some comments, and I kind of wanted to get to this particular image, which was the prototype, and obviously this was. Because this is this white plate here is the one that I'm talking about um, on the shipping cameras is obviously going to be black. But I've heard complaints about this lower lip down here. Is that is that a problem for you? It's not a problem for me, but I definitely have heard that from people. And why is why for for the record why is that a problem for some people? Is it a lens? Uh, issue? It's, a, it's a taste thing. It's how they're holding the camera. But for some reason, I don't know, maybe I have girly hands or something. It just <laughs> doesn't bother me at all because my hand fits actually perfectly above that lip to hold the lens. Um, and I guess some people, it just doesn't work that way for them. I'm not exactly sure, but I've heard that complaint. Does it does it get in the way of the functionality? of? I mean, I can't see the lens would necessarily bump into it. It's still short. But. No, I, I well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I haven't had that problem. I've just heard very vague complaints about it. You know, I, I don't have any solid complaints about that. Okay. And once we finally get one in our hands, we'll be able to look at that ourselves, right? Yeah, pretty much. I felt very defensive about all the trash talk that was going on and everywhere, you know, because I think that if people actually saw the camera, then, then they'd be into it. You know, 
both in physically using it and seeing the film results, because um, I, I was amazed at how small it was. I mean, one of the first shots that I took when I was in that demo room was, and, I, and I've posted it, is the 5D Mark II next to uh, the C300, and, and it's not very much bigger. Uh, it's obviously not a DSLR, but it's it's a very small and very it's handled... It's smaller than a DSLR if you build out a DSLR. Right, right. Um, some more questions. Let's see, I answered that one. Oh, I'm sorry. You answered that one. <laughs> um, going way back to the beginning, guest would like to know, John, how did you get your start as a director? Um, kind of by accident, actually, because uh, I always uh, wanted to be a DP. I, that was always my goal. I always wanted to shoot. Um, all my directors quit. And then, no, I'm just kidding. But actually, most of them have. But um, uh, mainly, it was uh, it, it was because uh, I was just always doing certain projects by myself, um, just because I wanted to. Mainly because if I wanted to shoot something cool, I would just direct it myself. Um, I worked at an ad agency uh, for a while, and when I wanted to do things such as shoot with the red, you know, when it first came out, I I, I would just direct the pieces that I wanted to shoot. Um, and then working at an ad agency, you know, eventually just a lot allowed me to just deal with people, you know, because it's a very difficult environment. Um, and eventually it just um, kind of kept going, so I just started getting more and more directing gigs. So at a certain point, I used to always call myself a cinematographer first, but um, at a certain point my billings changed um, so that my accountant had to say that I was a director, so that's when I decided to change it. <laughs> So you're back to that accounting issue. <laughs> I just feel like it's weird because people oftentimes call themselves filmmakers, but um, I always want to just ask the accountant if they are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, it it shows over on IMDb that you've got uh, nine credits for cinematographer and only three for director. So that must mean you're really a cinematographer. <laughs> well, I don't work in movies, so it shows you that I stopped working in movies. So. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm kind of very. I have very little interest in working in narrative. So I think that the difference is that you know, I mean, this camera is very interesting to me. But you know, I do a lot of work for television. Right. You know, and I do a lot of web, mostly that now. You know, and um, when you're doing documentaries and things for television or web or whatever, it's um, you know, I can't shoot a whole documentary by myself all night, you know, with a Scarlet, you know, I need too much media, you know, I need too much, um, I just need too many things to help me. Right. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the um, conversation that you had with, and I'm not a big Black Eyed Peas fan, but the documentary you did um, with Apple, what's his name? Apple D app? Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> those those names they picked, but I watched that this morning and I was very fascinated um, by that. That was all five Ds as well. That that was. Um, so for for those of you who are out there watching or listening to the audio versions, um, by the way, Jonathan's website is just simply Jonathan Yi, and that's Y I dot com. I highly recommend you go out there and take a look at some of his music videos. I've got one queued up here somewhere. Um, to show as well, but the documentaries are fabulous. He's also out there on Vimeo as Jonathan Yee, if you want to grab some of his videos straight off of Vimeo. Um, it's fascinating stuff to watch. He's he's doing some really cool stuff. So I, I always love meeting people like you and people that I never had known before. Um, so diving back into the questions, do the stories you've told in the past compel you to watch them again, or are you always looking forward to the next story? Meaning, I guess, are you, are you, are you talking about the projects I've done in the past? or I'm assuming just, that's what they're yeah, talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah just um, I mean, you always watch them again. You always wish that you had done things differently, um, and you learn from them. I think you know what I love about making anything is um i used to be you know a musician you know making albums with my friends and and i think that film was the only thing out there that gave me that same collaborative experience of creating something with your friends and 
being able to learn from it and kick back after it's over and see like what you've made together, you know, and, um, and film is pays you not like music. So, you know, it was, you know, I, I love working on these things and I love learning from it and I love, I don't know. I think I lean more towards documentary just because I just love watching documentary. I like real people and I, yeah. I like stories that are very naturalistic. I'm not an action guy. I'm not, I, I don't, do any of that stuff, you know, and I don't watch that stuff. I, I do, I'm just fascinated by people and real things, I guess, in the world rather than, you know, all, you know, that Hollywood explosions and everything. So, so whoever this guest was also had a follow up question for this earlier. Do you plan the emotional journey of the viewer as they watch your production? Um, <laughs> Not really. I mean, I think it's just mainly uh, just thinking about what you would think is funny. This camera test specifically, I was just thinking is, is what do I want to see and what would not bore me? Right. Uh, because I've seen so many of these. You know, we all look at this stuff. And um, it was kind of like just a jab at the whole genre. You know, that was the whole idea. And it came across very well. You've gotten so much exposure from this. It's hilarious. Yeah, and people have asked me if I'm going to do more camera tests. I was like, well, I, don't do, I clearly don't do camera tests. I mean, this was, <laughs> a, this was a joke. So, yeah. um, and, and that fits right in with the next question that was asked way earlier in the chat. Um, did Canon diss you because of your film, because of the F-bomb? No, that wasn't in that wasn't in there originally. Um, when I when I screened the first one, I I I I had a different line there, but um, it's saying the same thing. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, it wasn't anything to do with that. I think that it, that there was a lot of stress about the release of the product. Um, it was not a good time for them to take uh, risks with their promotional material. Um, so it just wasn't it just wasn't. Uh, right for them. They didn't feel, you know, it's, it's a big company, you know, you have a huge company like that. It's not like, you know, Red, Red is a smaller company. They can like take more chances with their promotion. They could take more chances with things like that. And, and, uh, I'm sure if I made a camera test like this for Red, I'm sure they would be all about it. But, you know, it just depends. There's too many people to say yes to it. And they were all, yeah. you know, yeah. it was too risky and there's just too many people to get to sign off. Yeah, if if you compare Canon's booth last year at or this year at NAB to Red's booth at NAB, I don't know if you go to NAB. Um, I've been asked to go. Uh, I I don't know if my my invitation has been revoked since. This <laughs> well, I I think uh, Canon really ought to uh, at least encourage you because because you've swayed quite a few people. Uh, but the the at this past NAB in April, the red booth and the very front of the booth you know how the i don't know if you've been to any of these shows but they have people models they have set set up so that you can you know like take your camera and and see the results on the camera of of a live scene and canon usually hires you know a girl or a guy and they had I, they had some baseball players there this year at the canon booth and um but at the red booth, they had people doing tattoos, and and they weren't fake tattoos. They were people <laughs> really getting tattoos. And I'm like, okay, so that's a totally different mindset. Canon would never do something that far out. Uh, so you're absolutely right in terms of their mindsets are very different. Well, yeah, I mean, well, you just when you have a smaller company, there and there's less people to to approve something that is just very different than your traditional voice, right you now. I mean, I just made that because I thought it was funny, and I was just assuming that you know they would like it too. But uh, of course, always I'm always guessing wrong. You know, <laughs> I'm always just like I'm always like, oh yeah, you know, like everyone will care about this, and then they don't, and then I pass on projects all the time that end up being huge. You right. know, and then this died, and then I posted it quietly on Tuesday night for a job pitch. You know. And, uh, you know, and just shared it with some people and they got crazy. Um, so, you Well, know. That, that's all because Planet 5D posted it first. Yeah. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> I know. And you know, and you know everybody. <laughs> I did send it around. So, 
Um, let's and see. Here's the thing. Here, here's the thing about like I know some people are talking about RAW and how awesome it is, and you know there is a camera that I've always, always, always wanted to own, and it, and it's by this small company called Iconoscope. You know, and uh, it really appeals to people like me who love sixteen and love this old timey film look. It, it's very unique, but I can't use uh, the camera because it'll just be only for my personal use because you know I can't. It's it's not going to work for right. any of my normal work. You know, that workflow is just a disaster, you know. So I think that the C300 is the first camera that I actually like the images a lot, and I can actually use it for, you know, a lot, if not all, of my work. And that, the, and, and because I didn't have that preset, uh, the audio for the actual music video was playing, and so nobody could hear me talking, so... Yikes. But there's my cat, in case anybody... One of my five cats hanging there. You have five? Yeah, we have five. Um, you must have space. <laughs> you know, it almost looks like she's on my shoulder. Get the microphone out of the way. I have, I have um, two cats. Do Hold you? Uh, we had one cat, then we decided to get two kittens, and... oh, look at that. Here's one. And... We ended up adopting two more, so four of our cats are from shelters, so yeah, good for us. Uh, speaking of the C300 video, oh, dadgummit. <laughs> you know, we were talking earlier, Jonathan, about um, how difficult this job is to do all by myself here. You yeah, I'm surprised you're running everything yourself. You held up your cat, and I was looking at your cat, but I wasn't broadcasting it to everybody else, so I blew <laughs> that one completely. Um, in the chat room, the question, speaking of the C300 video, was did you use uh, image staged IS lenses, that, and it's easy for me to say, on the handheld shots, and is it necessary for handheld, handheld shots with the C300? I used IS on the 24 to 105 zoom on the gondola. I used uh, IS on the 70 to 200 when we were doing steady cam. Um, those, I think, were the only IS lenses we had. Um, every the handheld stuff, you know, on the 85 millimeter prime, that doesn't have image stabilization. Right. Um, you don't need image stabilization, um, but it helped for certain things. Yeah. Stivic follows that up with how hand holdable is a camera over an extended period of time. It's great. I, I think that it's very hand holdable. I mean, the thing is, you know, you look at the shape, it looks very similar in shape to the Epic, but it's much lighter, you know, and, and that difference matters. If, if people remember going, hopping from the DVX100 to the HVX200, um, the DVX100 had a really good balance to it because it, it was the right size, you know, and it felt really good in your hand. But when you jump to the HVX 200, it got a little bit too fat and a little too heavy for the same form factor. And I think that this form factor is perfect for the weight that it is. Does it feel plasticky to you? Uh, not as much as uh, some other cameras. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not like an FS100 or something. Right, right. You know? I, I, I asked that question because I thought it was a very solid feel. When I yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's not an Alexa, but, you know, right. not... You're not comparing the two in terms of owning them. It's very robust, though. It's very rugged. So, um, Motion Minded asked, is the IS working from the lens? And I think the answer is obviously yes. 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 So, just to get that question in there. Um, Red Monster asks, can you make Steven Soderbergh a C300 convert? I think that he would like it because, I mean, isn't his whole deal that he likes to be autonomous, right? He likes to just do his whole thing himself, so I think he would love it. I know that uh, Shane Hurlbut's already talking about using the 300 um, on a full-length feature coming up that he's supposed to start shooting in February. Yeah, so. I saw that. Um. Oh, interesting question. What about overheating and flash record times? Okay, uh, what's really amazing about the camera design, I would say, is the fan. There is a fan, but in order to hear it, you really have to press your ear up against the body while it's on huh. in a quiet room. That's the first and I've it's heard. Suck it's sucking air up through it. it should be. I mean, they don't talk about this enough, right. but I think that 
it's circulating air in this very interesting way, so it never overheats. And the card record time is awesome. At the highest bit rate um, you're getting on a 32 gig card, I was getting 82 minutes. Um, so 82 minutes a card, you know, wow, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, also it can if you get like you know card capacity, you just keep getting higher anyway. And you know, imagine how high it would get at 128 or something. You know, when you get to those card sizes. So do you start feeling like you're risking things though if you're using? That kind of side, you know, that's that's a lot of film, on, or you know, all on one no, asset. No, I wouldn't say. I mean, I'm confident in Compact Flash, though. You right. know, it's not right. it's not failed me before. I mean, I get stressed out when I'm on a Red One MX when I'm running an interview that I haven't cut for a long time. You know, because it has to post the shot, and uh, I've had things happen. You know, I've lost power in the middle of something like that, and it's been a right. disaster. Right, and um. You know, I have to cut a lot with those cameras just because I have to. And maybe I should be more disciplined. Like, you know, when we shoot film, we cut a lot, you know. Right. Um, but for what I'm doing, I mean, I just need the camera to work in certain ways are very important. That it just works and doesn't fail. Um, things are backed up. Things look good, you know. And the things look good, you know, is actually not as important even as some other things, you know. <laughs> so. Well, I've I've heard stories of people, like, renting two uh, uh, red cameras because they're yep. afraid one's going to fail. So we do that. We do that. That's what's yeah. funny is sometimes you hear people brag like, "Well, this production rented four epics." It's like, "Well, you know, we that's, do that too because that's really worried. only two because <laughs> we're worried about we're doing a double camera shoot and we're right. worried, you know." Right. So, uh, motion minded also asked, "What about the highlights? Are you talking about non MX red or also? I guess this is a earlier question. Sorry. Um, how are the highlights? Both. Obviously, the MX red is superior by far to the non MX red, right. um, but it's just a characteristic of um, the sensor. I mean, the thing is, people might gripe about the C 300s Kodak and all these things, but the sensor you cannot complain about the sensor because it's amazing." So, do you understand that they flashed up some charts about the fact that it's a 4K sensor, but they're really only picking certain pixels for? Yeah. So this this took me a hard time, a little bit of time to ex understand, but it's actually very simple. Um, typically, in video cameras, usually they use this filtering system to get um, RGB color. But for every pixel on the screen for a C300 image, for every single pixel you see, there is four pixels creating that one pixel two greens a red and a blue so that way you know so there's two greens red blue right. just in like an order so that creates such a clean color fidelity so by the time it's being recorded it's just a, a much better signal you know to start with it's already a much better signal which is why it's so clean cool um <laughs> We cleared that question up. When did people stop using their light meters, Red Monster wants to know? Well, I still use my light meter. You'll see me holding a light meter and wearing a pouch. I mean, I'm not just a nerd with a fanny pack. That is actually <laughs> a light meter in those behind-the-scenes shots. Um, but, you know, that. I mean, I wish my Sekonic, maybe Sekonic should get on this. Is It would go up to 20,000, but it doesn't. So um, You know, that's a good point. I mean, that's when you don't use it and you rely on your other tools. But if you're outside in daylight and you can't see anything, like, yeah, please use your light meter. I mean, I always do. How does uh, – another chat question. How does this uh, – what is your opinion of the dynamic range stacked up against the Alexa? I think it's very close, if not – the same negligible like I mean it's very close the Isn't Alexa I also love the, dy the dynamic range of the Alexa was the first camera that reminded me of when you transfer 35 millimeter film to video um, the way that that looked and I think that smooth gradation um, I think the C300 really nailed that I mean it's it looks completely different than the DSLRs in that respect isn't the red uh, doesn't it actually have a higher dynamic range than either the Alexa or the C300? I'm not sure. Probably in their HDR mode, yeah. But the thing is, so there's a difference between, and this was something that was really hard for me to understand. It's like, okay, so you have all this image detail and it's 
you know, and you just grab it, you know, and then you work with that to get your final image. But the weird thing is with certain sensors like the Alexa being the way that it's built and the C300, I think, too, is that it grabs all that information, but the way that it's interpreting it, like, it has that smooth step up to the next level, mm -hmm. which is very filmic, you know, and it, do it doesn't just look just flat. And then you correct it, and then you actually just have to throw away all that information to make it look any good. Um, I, it's a very, filmic look is such an intangible thing right. to technically explain. It just you either like the image or not, and I just happen to like the images coming from the Alexa and the C three hundred like right out of the gate. You know, that's just my personal taste. <laughs> uh, interesting question from the chat room: Is this camera worth blowing your whole life savings on? Well, how old are you? <laughs> so that's a good question. Um, yeah, I wouldn't blow my whole life savings on it if hey, I, when I was when I was younger and poorer. It was uh, I blew my life savings every month. <laughs> it's like paying your rent and eating food. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, somebody in the chat room says they think the Alexa handles highlights better than the red. So. Well, I think that that comes back also to like, well, what are you talking about? What what does better mean? Right? Like, does it mean that it's grabbing it for you to deal with later, or is it that it it smoothly rolls it off in a in a way that that is pleasing to your eyes? Which I think is what Alexa Alexa focused on what people really cared about. I think you know why why do cinematographers never never shoot digitally? You know, like why what would make a cinematographer shoot digitally? And I think that's what they focused on. We're going to cut this off at a couple of more questions because we've been going for an hour and 15 now. So I certainly appreciate your time. But uh, And if you want to hang around, we can actually answer some questions in the chat room. But we can't just answer every question in the next 48 hours on this live broadcast. Uh, Follow-up from Stivic. Were you hand-holding with the monitor and handle attached? Um, yes, because I like how the handle puts the monitor in a good place for hand holding. And a lot of my behind the scenes pictures, those are all from with a Steadicam set up, so you won't see that set up that way. Uh, but yes, I, I like how the handle pushes it out more forward for hand hold, how the hand holding, yeah. Um, good question, I think. What do you think about the new DSLR that Canon announced, the 1DX, and where do you think we're going on the DSLR line, if you can say? I mean, the 1DX is so extreme. I mean, I'm not a still shooter, so, um, you know, 12, 12 second, I mean, 12 frames, 12 frames per second. second raw, that's crazy to me. I mean, the file size is, I mean, just right. amazing. Um, I mean, I think it just shows you that this stuff's not going away. Um, you know, it's it's going to be fine. I mean, every everyone who's upset about the C three hundred for not being a five D Mark three because it isn't a five D Mark three. You know, it's not supposed to be. So, right, right. I don't think that you could expect it to be that way. I'm just trying to judge the camera based on like, okay, mm -hmm. its own merits. You're going to compare it to a DSLR. It's a lot better for video. Yes, it's not going to take amazing photos like a five D Mark two, but right. you know, uh, they're just different tools. And I think for me. I think that this camera is really good, and I was just really sick of everybody trashing it so hard, like saying that this camera is not a good camera uh, because they weren't focusing on, this, on the same things. Like, I don't want full frame, right, right, for a video camera. I just don't want it. Like, I was in the Philippines with the Black Eyed Peas, that guy, Apple D app, there, like, shooting a wide shot on a 50 millimeter lens on a 1.4, and having a wide shot with only one person in focus was really bad you know like it looked weird you know right. if i was shooting on a 7d it would have looked more normal to me just because a 1.4 is acceptable i think way more on a super 35 size sensor than it is on a full frame camera right interesting interesting stuff all right we're gonna we're gonna cut this question as the last one i think and then we'll if you've got time we'll answer a few more in the chat room after the show um Colin would like to know, and this is a little longish, but I think it's a good ending question. Okay, so should we buy this or wait for Canon to come up with something even better? Like you said before, it's their first cinema camera. 
Uh, yes, we know there are more cameras coming down the line. I can tell you that he asks more stuff about other cameras and NDA and blah, blah, blah. But is is this the one you would buy, or do you want to wait for the next one? Depends on what you do. I mean, this is the one I would buy. So, I think, I think you get stuck in the, the mode of always wanting the next thing. The The grass is always greener, right? So, Not really, though, because sometimes, like... You know, for a while, I mean, none of this mid-range stuff was exciting. I think the F3 was like, I mean, last summer was the summer of F3 for sure. I mean, because that ful fulfilled a niche. But I would hate to have to continue to work with the F3. The Red 1, you know, I mean, I would hate to carry that many cases to every set, you know. Um, <laughs> it just, in the Alexa 2, you know, same thing. You know, it just, it just a big thing. So, um yeah, I don't know. I mean, I own a 16 millimeter film camera and I own a DSLR, but uh, I think this will be a perfect camera for most of my bread and butter work. And I think that if I can make money using this camera and I'd be happy using this camera and make my work better, then I think you should buy it. You know, I mean, that's, that's you know, if it financially makes sense. Right. And I, I think I would add to that, especially the financial aspects of it, um, we know there are other DSLRs coming. We know there's a Cinema EOS DSLR that Canon announced. We know that there's going to be 5D Mark III coming probably in 2012. We don't know exactly when. Um, if, you, if you can afford the higher end of movie cameras and, and you are making, uh, and if I say it financially, if it financially makes sense that you will get your money out of that use, then use it then buy it. If you can't really afford that, maybe you should wait for the next range of DSLRs and then see what 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 you've got from that and uh I still I still think it's interesting that uh that you and many others have highlighted that the, the other players in the market have sort of done some I think okay things with the Sony and the Panasonic, but Canon still seems to be ruling this market, don't they? Well, I mean, I thought I thought that people weren't... I was really worried that this camera wasn't going to get the life and the attention that it deserved after... At first, I was like, no, no, no. Like, the moment people use it, they will totally get it. But then, right. you know, the internet was pretty brutal about <laughs> uh, how they felt about it, you know? And when my close friends were starting to put in orders for Scarlet's, I was like, oh, man, like, you know, this that's weird you know i just didn't uh i you know that's also why i'm happy that people saw the video and, and responded to it you know um because to be honest those shots especially those night shots like they were not ideal conditions they they you know those areas were just bad shooting conditions so i was surprised people were like oh this looks good it's like oh okay sure it looks good fine <laughs> this is like a really bad thing like especially that ice cream shot it's like you know a bad area to sh shoot so Right. And we'll we'll be expecting that bad ice cream movie to come out from you in 2012, all right? And, <laughs> and when you get that made, you we, you'll we'll have you back on Planet 5D and we'll spend 2 hours discussing every scene from that movie. All right? Nice. Jonathan, it's been a great pleasure to have you on. We thank certainly you. appreciate the movie that you've put out. I think Canon ought to uh really say thank you because <laughs> from the tide that i've seen turning uh you've you've made quite an impression on many people yeah i hope i hope they aren't aren't mad at me for that whole thing and are you know happy about it so um. i think i think they're actually probably pretty happy about the the way it's turning out in that they didn't have to officially bless it and yet they're still getting the wave of excitement from it um so i i hope they acknowledge it acknowledge you for doing that in some way shape or form at least get you to NEB and I'll meet you face to face this year um, but thank you for coming on if anybody wants to go visit Jonathan's website it's jonathanye.com you're on twitter as at sign jonathan underscore I'm sorry I said that wrong it's john j-o-n underscore y-i and any place else that you want them to find you uh, that's it, pretty much. Yeah, I All would right. say. Yep. Thanks again, and if you'll hang around for a few minutes, we'll see if we can crank out a couple more answers. And thanks, everybody, for watching Planet 5D, and come back in a few weeks when we have some more exciting guests. <laughs>